beginning of the sermon material comes from Max Lucado in his book, Grace. And the first part is Max writing, and then he turns it over to another man. It says, between 1854 and 1929, about 200,000 orphans and abandoned children in eastern cities were placed on westbound trains and shipped across the United States in search of homes and families. Since many of the children had lost their parents in epidemics, others were children of down-on-their-luck immigrants, some were orphaned by the Civil War, others by alcohol. And they all needed homes. They were loaded on trains in groups of 30 to 40, and they stopped at rural areas for viewings, and the kids would be lined up on the platform, railroad station pretty much like livestock at the auction and prospective parents would ask questions, evaluate their health, maybe check their teeth. If they were selected, the children would go home with the people. If not, they got back on the train. And it was called the orphan train. And it says Lee Nailing remembers this experience. He remembers living at the Jefferson County Orphan Home for two years he was eight years old, he was taken with his two younger brothers to the train station in New York City. And the day before, his biological father gives him a pink envelope with his dad's name and address on the envelope. It says, write me when you get to your destination. So he remembers taking the envelope, putting it in his pocket. And then while they were on the train, he and his two little brothers fell asleep. And when he woke up, the envelope was gone. And he never saw it again. He didn't have any way to contact his dad. It says, things get worse before they get worse. Lee and his two brothers are taken to several towns. In the sixth day, somebody in some little rural Texas town selected one of his little brothers. And then another family selected Lee and his other brother. <clears throat> and pretty soon, Lee gets taken out of that home and sent to another home. And it's a farm, and he'd never been on a farm. And the city kid didn't know that you weren't supposed to open the cages for the chicks, and he did, and the farmer got mad and kicked him out. It says, in a succession of sad events, Lee has lost his father. He has ridden a train from New York to Texas. He's been separated from his two little brothers and kicked out of two homes. His little heart is about to break. Finally, he's taken to the home of a tall man and a short, plump woman. And during the first supper, he doesn't say anything. And he makes plans that night to run away. The next morning, they sit him down to a breakfast biscuits and gravy, and he reaches for one, and she says, not before we say grace. Mrs. Naomi, stop me. This is Lee now telling what happened. Not until we've said grace, and I watched as they bowed their heads, and Mrs. Naomi began to speak softly to our Father, thanking him for the food and the beautiful day, and I knew enough about God to know that the woman's our Father was the same our Father who art in heaven that the visiting preachers recited to us at the orphanage. But I couldn't understand why she was talking to him as though he were sitting here with us waiting on his share of the biscuits. <laughs> I began to squirm in my chair. And then Mrs. Nailing thanked God for the privilege of raising a son. And I stared as she began to smile. She was calling me a privilege. And Mr. Nailing must have agreed with her because he was starting to smile too. And for the first time since I boarded the train, I began to relax. A strange, warm feeling began to fill my aloneness, and I looked at the empty chair next to me. Maybe in some mysterious way, our father was seated there, and he was listening to the next softly spoken words. Help us to make the right choices as we guide him, and help him to make the right choices too. Dig in, son, said the man's voice. Startled me. I hadn't even noticed the amen because my brain was still back at the choices part. As I eat my plate, I thought about that. He said, hate and anger and running away seemed to me to be the only choices. But maybe there were others. This Mr. Naylor didn't seem to be so bad. This thing about having an Our Father shook me up a little, but I ate in silence. After breakfast, they walked me to the barber shop for a haircut. We stopped at every one of the six houses along the way, at every door, and they introduced me as our new son. It says, as we left that last house, I knew at the first light next day I would not be running away. There was a hominess here that I had never experienced before. At least I could give it a try. And then 
and there was something else. Although I didn't know where Papa was or how I could write to him, I had the strong feeling that I had found not one, but two new fathers, and that I could talk to both of them. And that's the way it turned out. Now I'll ask how many emotions did you either hear or even feel in that story? And I sat in a part of a group <clears throat> Wednesday with the same silence and attention during a child abuse awareness class that I took at Licky Memorial Hospital. They had different pictures. Pictures that I will put up on the wall for you. Pictures of little kids who were beaten with belts. This is how you identify the buffalo groups. Pictures of little kids who were held or dipped in scalding water. And we listened to Nicole Bromley, this is her, the author of those books, Hush and Breathe, and she is sharing, standing like I am with you, sharing very openly, very honestly about her emotions and her choices as she battled, and she still struggles to overcome, <clears throat> nearly a decade of sexual abuse at the hand of her stepfather, <clears throat> since she lived a nightmare existence between the ages of 5 and 14. All the while playing every sport, being team captain, being elected uh, homecoming queen, Miss Popular, All-American Girl, nobody knew her secret. She is now in her 30s. Nicole is happily married to one of the ER doctors down at Lincoln Memorial. They have two sons. Her mom was there with her to share their story and to support her. And Nicole now travels as often as she can to Cambodia. She fights for freedom for girls who are caught in sex, trafficking, and prostitution. Now, now these are emotional stories. And, and this particular sermon is focused on this very aspect of our life, which is our emotional health. And, and, and the basis for the overall series for this month, Here's to Your Health, it stems from an article I read about Rick Warren out at the Saddleback Church baptizing people. It says Warren was inspired to create their health resource. They have a book called The Daniel Plan. After he baptized more than 800 people in one day, in November of 2010, it says after lowering more than 145,000 pounds of weight into the baptistry, he thought, wow, everybody's fat. <laughs> And he's concluded, he said, I know that's not a real spiritual thought for a preacher to have, but he also thought, I'm fat too. I'm as out of shape as everybody else. And, and that got me thinking. I haven't done many series about hell. I looked it up in my search. There are five sermon titles out of 1,594. There are five that have any mention of the word health in any aspect that has to do with physical. I typed in the word weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, I got zero. I have never preached about weight loss in 25 years. And somebody's going to be thinking, well, yeah, because whenever I start talking about dieting and weight loss, I get the cold shoulder and some snarky comment. <laughs> what do you know about weight loss? I know this. There are a lot of diets that don't work. I know there are a lot of people who wish they could do something about their weight. And I know that Jesus cares and it matters. This is what Jesus said in John 10, 10. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Anybody here feel like there's any ways in which your life could be more abundant if your weight were less? 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And Rick Warren sums it up. He says, the Bible says, God made my body. Jesus died for my body. The Holy Spirit lives in my body. So I better take care of it. So I started looking for resources and help and health and materials. And I found a topic that's addressed in this book that I'm reading in the cover. It says, First Place for Health. And it, it's going to say the same thing that you've heard before, and you know our bodies are connected, right? The other aspects of health factor in to weight and things physical. <coughs> On page 
page 15 of the book, it says, You see, losing weight is not the real answer to our problems. But being overweight is often a warning sign that we are not where we need to be in life. The real answer is that we need to live a balanced life. And I'm trusting that you've heard that, you've read that, you've seen that. The struggles, the battles that we have in other areas of life can show up in our physical body. Emotional, spiritual, mental health, they're all intertwined. And the background, the foundational verse for everything that we share this month is this one, Mark 12, 30. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. They're all connected. And this morning we'll, we'll go through the emotional health first, the basics. A couple of basics, and the first one is this. Emotions are real. <clears throat> the first basic is that emotions are real, and if you have World Magazine, you could have read about hired hand holders. It says the pressure felt by young Chinese women to find husbands has created a new industry in China, rental boyfriends. It says feeling the disapproval of family members, unmarried women in their 20s who live in Beijing can hire a young man for about a month's salary to pose as their boyfriend on the trips home to the Chinese countryside. That's base pay, about a month's pay. According to one of the rental bows, his name is Zhu Raisin, says there are also hidden fees. Holding hands will cost you extra. About a dollar per time. Kisses and hugs go for about the same rate. If you want to go shopping together, that's ten dollars an hour. Um, movies are additional and it depends. For some reason a thriller costs more than a comedy. It's all in the contract. And, and you somebody to say, why would you do that? Because emotions are that real. And emotions are that powerful. I said feeling the disapproval of family members causes those young women to consider. This is James Flora. He's writing in Pulpit Digest. And you can see if you can hear these. He said, a group of motion picture engineers classified the following as the ten most dramatic sounds in the movie. Ten most dramatic sounds. A baby's first cry. The blast of a siren. The thunder of breakers on rocks, the roar of a forest fire, a foghorn, the slow drip of water, the galloping of horses, the sound of a distant train whistle, the howl of a dog, the wedding march. And they said, of those ten, one causes more emotional response and more upheaval than any other sound. It has the power to bring forth almost every human emotion, sadness, envy, regret, sorrow, tears, as well as supreme joy. On that list, they said, that's the wedding march. Vicki Crack said this online. God has emotions. He created us in his image. We have an emotional capacity. God loves. He's joyful. He feels compassion and sorrow and anger. Jesus Christ, as a human being, reveals the heart of God and expresses sorrow, anger, frustration, disappointment, amazement, grief, joy. Our emotional makeup is one of the ways that God's image is seen in all of us. And G. Walter Hannison wrote it in Christianity Today. I'm spellbound by the intensity of Jesus' emotions. He doesn't show a twinge of pity. It's heartbroken. Not a passing irritation, but terrifying anger. Not a silent tear, but groans of anguish. Not a weak smile. Ecstatic celebration. Jesus' emotions are like a mountain river cascading with clean water. And I like this post that I saw online. You may have seen it. If anybody ever asks you that question, well, what would Jesus do? Remind him that flipping over tables and chasing people with a whip are within the realm of possibilities. Grab a whip and clean house. That's what Jesus would do. <clears throat> it is okay to feel emotions. And some people say, we should only express positive emotions. That's not the biblical model. If God calls something sinful, he doesn't want us to feel positive about that. It's negative. It hurts. Righteously sorrowful and angry about it. You can guess, I'm sitting there Wednesday at a day-long child abuse seminar. There were a wealth of emotions. And some of that was sadness and anger and rightly so. <clears throat> emotions are real. 
Emotions also intertwine with all the other aspects of our health. Vicki Kraft said this, you know it. We cannot simply separate the different compartments of our natures into the different components of our natures into watertight compartments. Just as we're able to experience physical pain or pleasure, we all have the capacity to experience emotional pain or emotional pleasure. I listed Proverbs 17.22, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Job 15, 12 and 13, why has your heart carried you away? Why do your eyes flash so that you vent your rage against God and pour out such words from your mouth? Have, have, I'm asking a question. Have your emotions impacted your health recently? <laughs> but I'm going to answer it for everybody in the room and say, yeah, they have. Whether you know it or admit it or not, they have. And Vicki Kraft said, Wait, see if this feels true. When everything is working out, when, when you move into a new house, uh, when a kid finds a new job, finishes school, they marry what you say is the right man or woman. You get a good report from the doctor. So when you actually come to the end of the month and you have money left over, you know, these occurrences make us happy. Our emotions respond to our physical circumstances. Well, your emotions are going to respond to your spiritual circumstances too. A person overwhelmed with guilt, when they find forgiveness by trusting in Christ, they feel cleansed and free. She said, you often see it women who have carried the guilt and the pain of an abortion for years, and they find emotional and spiritual healing through Christ's forgiveness, particularly within the context of a support group. After immorality has destroyed their self-worth, I've seen women renounce their unhealthy lifestyles and find joy in obedience to the Lord. All emotions. So what happens if your emotions start to become a runaway train that you can't control? Do I often feel overwhelmed by emotions? Do you see yourself? And these are the descriptions that they had on the page. Have you experienced rejection or been treated unfairly? Are you struggling with emotional devastation from the past? Were you molested or neglected? Are you in a marriage that has soured and you feel hopeless? Do others say you seem to have it all together, but underneath the surface you are seething with anger and bitterness, unable to forgive things that were are you overwhelmed with guilt and regret for things you have done and you can't forgive yourself? I said, when we face uncertain, painful, or tragic circumstances in life, we feel these emotions. Sorrow, confusion, anger, pain. The emotions are just as much given to us by God. He uses the feelings to draw us closer to Him. Just like your physical pain. So if something's wrong with your body and you go and get it checked, emotional pain is a way of saying something's wrong with your spirit. I thought of 2 Samuel 12. David's uh, adulterous affair with Bathsheba has been uncovered. It's laid bare. It is raw and painful, and there's a whole rush of emotions. And the child that's born of that union is stricken in. And this is 2 Samuel 12, 16. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went into his house and spent the nights lying on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. The text goes on to say, David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they thought, while the child was still living, we spoke to David. But he wouldn't listen to us. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do something desperate. And, and I assume that how many of us have either been in the shoes of those servants, if not in the shoes of David. And the twist in that Bible account, if you're familiar with it, comes from the fact that David sees this out of the corner of his eye. He knows that the servants are whispering. And he figures out what is happening. And he asks the point blank, is the child dead? And they say yes. And he immediately gets up and washes his face and shaves and eats and goes back to shall you say regular life. And they're all, we don't get this. And he's very blunt. He says, when the child was alive, I prayed and hoped that maybe God would relent. And he has not. And I know that I will not see my son back here in this life, but I can go and see him in the future. And yet you know David had emotions, and he had issues, and he had great sins. But he refused to let even the guilt and the shame rule his life. 
Emotions become a danger to our health when they start ruling our life. And you can put a real quick little self-test on this. Do I impose a negative attitude or emotion on a situation that doesn't merit a negative emotion? Do you wake up? You wake up feeling grumpy. So you impose grumpiness on the spouse and the kids and the co-workers. Why is that feeling there in the first place? It doesn't have anything to do with the kids and the spouse and co-workers, but it's imposed on them. Are your emotions ruling? And if, and if you're honest, you might be sitting there going, maybe, probably. Somebody might say yes. So that's the other side, the emotional aids, the health aids. We, we, we'll put two on there, and one's real simple. You just got to show up. We need to show up. We often think, Nicky Kraft wrote this, we often think we can solve our spiritual needs with a change in our physical circumstances. Take a little vacation. Go to the mall, buy a new wardrobe. For some people, escape will be alcohol, drugs. Others, it's just live for pleasure. Those are remedies. So those are not remedies. They're band-aids. They're temporary anesthetics. You're treating symptoms. How many times, this is hard, but how many times have my emotions won out in the past because I'd rather run or dull or escape instead of showing up and facing this head on? And Joyce Meyer, a lot of people know, says some people put, pay big money for professional help and never find the answers they want to hear. She says, I'm convinced it's because many of these people don't really want to be helped. Instead, they want someone to excuse them from their problem. It's not you. It's other people in your life. They're causing you problems. They're making you upset. She says, I'm not saying that people don't do horrible things. People hurt us and it's not right. But the bottom line is this. You cannot control what everybody else does, but you can control your reaction to it. It is time to stop letting someone else's bad behavior steal your joy. And if I had to love and respect a little wooden block from the marriage series, I would put it up here and turn to session five. My response is my responsibility. And I sat there Wednesday and listened to Nicole Ronley not only recount the horrors of what she endured, but also how she showed up, faced them down, works at it one day at a time. Do I need to be ready to show up tomorrow? <laughs> Battle the emotions tomorrow. Somebody put it this way. Just because your body wants sugar doesn't mean you have to get it, sugar. <laughs> Just because your body wants to lay there on the couch all day doesn't mean you have to give in. When emotions prompt us to make unhealthy decisions, you have a choice to make. Zig Ziglar said you got to act the way you want to feel. If you don't feel courageous, act courageous. It's not being false. It's decisive. Focus your mind on moving ahead, even when you don't want to. And anybody's ever exercised in those, there's a thousand and one excuses why we don't want to work out. It's true for any regular discipline. You, you have to decide to show up. And I, I could ask for, I don't mean, but I could ask for a show of hands from our dairy farmers. Anybody ever want to admit, yeah, there's been a couple of January mornings when it was 5 a.m. and 5 below. Yeah, the thought did cross my mind. I don't really feel like getting up and milking cows today. <laughs> you don't stay in that business very long if you don't get in to how you feel. The biblical example of showing up. Joshua 3. God's people are on a road to a much better place, but there's this huge obstacle that's in their path. They have a decision to make. We're going to let our feelings get the better of us and run off again. Or we're going to act on truth regardless of feelings. And the opposite, obstacle this time is the Jordan River. Okay? It's right there in front of them. It's harvest. It's flooded. It's foaming and surging and logs and sticks and dirt and mud. And it's impossible for them to cross the river. Beyond the river is the promised land. Forty years. They have been wandering and waiting and looking and always knowing it's over there. Flowing with milk and nuts. And God's command is what? Go stand in the water. <laughs> Go walk into the joy. And I just want you to put yourself in those people's shoes. Literally, or take your shoes off and hold them in your hand if you think they're going to get wet. Because God said, stand in the river. And you have to say, what's God going to do if I go stand? But the people of Israel showed up that day. And the priest took the lead and they marched into the water. And as soon as their feet touched the river, what happens? The water stops flowing. It 
piles up miles away. And there's dry ground to get. They walk right into the promised land that day. Do I need to decide? I, I gotta, I'm not going to let my feelings rule. I'm going to show up. And if I fall down, I'm going to show up again the next day. A lot of people share a lot of positives from Rick Warren and others, and you may or may not be aware of it. He said after their son, 20-something son's suicide, Rick Warren regained about half of the 65 pounds that he lost going through their annual plan. He said, I didn't sleep well for months. When you don't sleep well, your hunger level goes up. And I fell off the wagon. And all those pounds I lost kept finding me. But as anyone in recovery will tell you, setbacks are part of the process in long-term change. So rather than beat myself up, I asked God and my friends to help me get back on track. He said, people learn from weakness. When I began to get a handle on the grief, I already knew what to do to live a healthier life. That's showing up. Am I willing to face my feelings, my fears tomorrow? And I got an answer for it. You say, well, honestly, I'm not willing. This is the prayer that you pray. Lord, I am not willing. But I'm willing to be made willing. And the last part is to, be, to try to be an encourager. We always talk about this. The best help to exercise yourself is extend a hand and help somebody else. And the first place book asks the question, says, have I developed that cruise ship, it's all about me mentality? i got nothing against a good cruise. I enjoy it as much as the next person. But what's the mentality? Food whenever I want. Sleep as I want. Activities and shade and entertainment whenever I want. Contrast that with the military vessel. With the confidence of the populace and the government, and they are setting sail with humanitarian aid to serve and protect. Now it's all about the mission. And the crew will eat and sleep and exercise and recreate, but it's always to support the mission. There's no gentle way to say this. They wrote, if the cruise ship outlook characterizes your life, it is time for the cruise to end. It is time to change ships. There's another ship sailing, and this one's on a mission. The cruise ship mentality wreaks havoc with your emotions. It always caters to, well, what do I feel like doing? You filter everything through that same expectation. How does it make me feel? If you let your body run free, are you going to be battling these questions constantly? Why should you eat a healthy snack when we both know there's a box of Krispy Kremes on the counter? Why should you get up and read your Bible early when you'd really benefit from 15 minutes of sleep? If you let your feelings rule, they will typically choose immediate gratification. And that mindset always makes us feel miserable needed. Can I choose? I'm going to constantly be aware of other people. Hebrews 10.25, let's encourage one another. There's a purpose there for somebody outside of yourself. Somebody needs you. Encourage them. 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. And I can read this one a couple times. When life is ruled by feelings, you'll do everything except lay down your life. Because your primary goal is to gratify your feelings. When you follow the call of Christ to consider the needs of others, the constant question becomes what? What's the most loving thing I can do for that person? Physical sharing, spiritual encouragement, powerful prayer. Can, can I challenge you to start your week tomorrow with this statement? I believe the Lord is asking me to show up with an attitude of encouragement in I believe that tomorrow the Lord is asking me to show up with an attitude of encouragement in life. And, it, you know, there's no magic pill for this. There's no quick fix. How long did it take you to get to how you feel today? Being unhealthy doesn't happen overnight. Getting healthy doesn't happen overnight. Let's say this. We'll commit to tomorrow. We will show up. We will encourage other people, even if it means a challenge. And I'm going to conclude this sermon with a question of Chuck White. We did not collude in any way, shape, or form on what I'm about to say, did we? He has no idea what I'm about to say. But I'm going to tell you the same thing he told you. Because that's what God said to do. A story is told about Martin Luther, the great 16th century reformer. His life was characterized by huge successes. He was 
He's also known for huge periods of despair. During one such period, he moped around the house for days, and getting out of bed was a chore. And his days were spent in blank inactivity, and his nights were self-pity and moroseness. Finally, his wife had had enough. Nothing she seemed to be doing was getting anywhere, so she tried another tactic. She got up in the morning and put on her very best funeral attire. She came into the kitchen, and he looked at her dressed in head to toe in black. What's the matter? Are you going to a funeral? Yes. Who <clears throat> died? God. God is dead. God is not dead! <laughs> well, you sure act like it. Luther reportedly snapped out of his despair that very morning. <laughs> and it says, you know, I don't know how much of that's been fictionalized. We certainly know that there are depressions and issues that require more than an attitude adjustment. But don't miss that point. There are people who live as if God is dead. So whenever you feel like giving up and quitting, don't. If you get to the point where you think God isn't there, or maybe He's there, but He just doesn't care, don't let your feelings override what you know to be true. Remember what Chuck told you, and what this sermon ends with, and what those same kids who just did such a good job, I remember them not that long ago, my God's not dead. Be surely a lot. Whether you have to whisper that or sing it or shout it, I don't care. Psalm 147.3 He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. God is not dead. He surely is. choices.